Hello everyone, in this video I'm going to talk to you about how you can estimate what is known as the expected market risk premium, one of the key inputs that goes into the capital asset pricing model. Now it turns out that there are two ways in which you can estimate the expected market risk premium. There is something called the historical approach, which is the subject of this video, and then there is another approach called the dividend discount model approach, and that is something that I will talk about in a separate video. So before I start talking about what the historical approach is, let's first recall what we mean by expected market risk premium. Put simply, expected market risk premium is the rate of return that investors can expect by investing in a broad portfolio of risky assets over and above the risk-free rate. How much will be your excess return? Well, the historical approach simply says, look, why don't we just look at what a well-diversified portfolio of risky assets has yielded over and above the risk-free rate in the past? If we can take a look at all these differences in the past years, we could average across all of them, and this would give us a sense of what this difference has been historically, which will therefore give us an estimate of what this difference might look like in the future. So calculate the average annual return earned by a well-diversified value-weighted portfolio over a long period of time. It's important that the portfolio is value-weighted so that more weight is assigned to large stocks and less to small stocks. In finance, we often refer to this as the market portfolio, and it is very common in finance to proxy such a portfolio of risky assets using something like the S&P 500 index. Second step, to calculate the average annual return earned by default-free or risk-free securities. And in the U.S., a close proxy for that is the U.S. Treasuries. And then we simply calculate the difference. Please understand, and this is a very, very important point, once we have an average using historical data, we're using that average to come up with an estimate of what this premium might look like going forward. Capital asset pricing model is a forward-looking model. We're trying to understand the rate of return that investors should expect going forward, and we are coming up with an estimate of what the market risk premium might look like going forward based on what it has looked like in the past. So the implicit assumption is that the past is representative of the future. Is this a reasonable assumption? It can be, but it also may not be. So especially in situations where the economy has experienced a very severe downward shock, like it did at the time of the financial crisis, for example. As you can imagine, in those times, investors can become quite risk averse. A person who was previously willing to invest in the stock market might say, no, I don't want to. And in those situations, the market or the risky assets may need to offer a return over and above the risk-free rate that is considerably higher. So in those situations, the expected market risk premium may be higher than it has been historically. So with that, let me show you how you can come up with this estimate using historical data. So what I'm doing here is showing you the historical returns earned by large company stocks, long-term government bonds, and U.S. Treasury bills. The data goes all the way from 1926 till 2020. The first thing to understand here is that U.S. Treasury bills and long-term government bonds are both different forms of borrowing by the government. The difference is that U.S. Treasury bills tend to have a maturity of one year or less. In this case, we're looking at bills maturing in one year. And then we're looking at long-term government bonds, which typically have a maturity of 10, 20, or 30 years. And so if I scroll below, I can actually show you what the arithmetic average looks like of all these three numbers. So for example, the market historically has earned an average return of about 12%. If you look during the same time, how much rate of return did long-term government bonds offer? You can take an average over here and see that this has roughly been about 6%, whereas short-term bonds have on average yielded about 3%. And based on these numbers, therefore, you can actually come up with an estimate of historical market risk premium. If you look at the difference between these two numbers, the historical market risk premium has been about 6.12%. However, if you look at the difference between 12.16% and 3.34%, 
this estimate comes out to about 8.82%. Now, you might be wondering, which of these two should you use? Well, actually, it depends on the situation. I'll talk about it in just a minute. But because of these numbers, it is not uncommon for a lot of analysts to use an expected market risk premium that is somewhere between 6 to 8%. Now, some of you probably are saying, well, this looks pretty straightforward and easy, but where do I get my data to come up with an estimate? Actually, there are a number of uh, different places that you can get it from. One extremely valuable source of information for you is this website maintained by Professor Aswath Damodaran. Professor Damodaran is uh, a professor of finance at uh, New York University. And if you go to his website, you'll notice that over here, he records the annual returns on stocks, bonds, and U.S. Treasury bills all the way from 1928 till 2023. And as you scroll through these data, you'll notice that uh, Professor Damodaran looks at the difference between the returns earned by stocks and U.S. Treasury bills and also between stocks and long-term government bonds. And based on that, you can calculate the premia as well. Now, even though the historical approach to estimating expected market risk premium is pretty straightforward, what you will find is that different people will come up with different estimates of this number. Why? Well, here are a couple of reasons. First, the number of historical observations that you should use. In the calculations that I just showed you, our data went all the way from 1926 to 2020. When you look at the Modaran's website, you see that the data goes from 1928 to 2023. Now, there are some people who will tell you that uh, these data on stock returns and bond returns go all the way back to 1871. In fact, some databases go all the way back to 1792. So here's the question. Should you average across all these observations? Well, some people say yes. Some people say no. For one, there is a question of reliability. How reliable is all this data that is very, very ancient? In fact, other people are argue that, well, the way the stock markets and the capital markets behaved in the 1800s is uh, very different from how they behave in the 1900s or the 2000s. More specifically, people's attitudes towards risk and therefore their degree of risk aversion may have changed over the years. And so for that reason, some analysts actually advocate using past 10, 20 or 50 years of data. In general, it is considered a good idea to use a large number of observations because we want the standard error of our estimate to be as low as possible. However, be mindful that some people can make a case for using more recent data, while others can make a case for using older data as well. Number two, choice of the risk-free rate. As you saw moments ago, we can look at historical stock returns in relation to short-term government bonds or long-term government bonds, and depending on which we use, we get a different estimate. Generally speaking, we should be consistent with the choice of the time to maturity that we have used over here. So if we are using a risk-free rate over here, which is on long-term government bonds, then we should look at how much historically large company stocks have yielded over and above long-term risk-free rates. And similarly, if we are using U.S. Treasury bills over here, then this difference should be between a well-diversified portfolio and a short-term risk-free rate like the U.S. Treasury bill. One thing that I want to point out here, and this is again very, very important, especially for students who are new to finance, that this risk-free rate over here in magnitude is going to be different from this risk-free rate. I know when you look at risk-free rate here and risk-free rate here, they seem the same thing, but they aren't. When we estimate the risk-free rate over here, we use the risk-free rate that exists today, whereas this number is coming from an average of historical data. So be careful. Don't think that this risk-free rate and this risk-free rate are the same in magnitude. Point number three, in the calculations that I showed you, I calculated the arithmetic average or the simple average of historical returns. But there are analysts who argue that sometimes calculating a geometric average might make more sense, especially in situations where we are evaluating relatively long-term investments. Now, for the purposes of this video, I'm not calculating geometric averages nor going into a deeper discussion of why arithmetic versus geometric. The main point here is that even with the same data, you can see different estimates of a historical average and therefore a different estimate of the expected market risk premium. If you found this video useful, click the like button and subscribe to the channel. And feel free to ask any questions using the comment section. Happy learning.